Liu Yushi, Crow Robe Ali. By Redbird Bridge, wild plants flower. Outside Crow Robe Ali, the evening sun slants. Swallows that nested by noblemen's mansions now fly into houses of the common people. So we continue with a poem by Liu Yushi. Actually, a couple of poems by him because the next one, Spring Song, is also attributed to his authorship. We've encountered poems by Liu Yushi before. He's one of the relatively important mid Tang poets, and uh, he's a special favorite of mine for different reasons. We won't recapitulate much about his life except, you know, mentioning that he was he occupied mid to high level posts in the court, and uh, he was very close to Liu Zongyuang. And like him, he was a member of the group of reformers. And uh, Wang Shuwen, who in 805, when the new emperor uh, Shunzong rose to the throne, attempted to implement some progressive reforms in the country. They were soon stopped, the emperor forced to abdicate, and uh, all these reformers were either executed or sent into the most remote parts of the empire into exile. Liu Zongyuang, as I think we've already mentioned, never really made a comeback from those uh, positions in exile. Liu Yushi was a little bit luckier. After a decade or more in in the remotest regions, he did manage to 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 come back and uh, and he had several then uh, anecdotes and occupied some posts. Okie dokie. So this poem that we're reading today, Crow Crow Robe Ali, is a, a, a very good example of the Ubi Sunt topic in uh, Japanese poetry. The Ubisunt is a topic in medieval uh, European poetry, uh, best represented, for example, in Spanish by the coplas uh, of Jorge Manrique. And it's a, a, a lamentation and evocation at the same time of the splendors of the big monuments of the big cultures of the past. Ubisunt, where have they gone? And this is a lament on the imperial capital of the south. You will remember that we said that during the long period of disunion, in which northern China, during about 300, 400 years, was occupied by different barbarians and ruled by different barbarian dynasties, while the south of China remained in Chinese hands, but also had very fragile and short-lived dynasties that on average lasted about 50 years or so on the throne, sometimes less. During this period of disunion, Southern China, which was the bastion of Chinese civilization and culture, had as its capital the city of uh, Jiangkang in the Jiangsu River Valley. This city uh, would later, well, it would suffer different accidents, but would later become uh, Nanjing, uh, which was during the Ming Dynasty, the, also again the capital of China. In fact, Nanjing means southern capital, as opposed to Beijing, which means northern capital. So, although this poem doesn't mention Jiang Khan by name, I think uh, by this time it was called Jiang Ling, maybe. It had been destroyed uh, by the unifiers of the country, the Shui dynasty, when they conquered the south, but later it had been rebuilt under the Tang dynasty, perhaps not in exactly the same location as the old capital. So, even though this poem doesn't mention Jiang Khan, it's a poem about Jiang Khan. It's a lament for the disappearance of the capital of the south, and the culture and all the people associated with it. The title is Crow Robe Ali, or this can also be translated, I think, as Black Robe Ali, and it makes reference to a street that once existed in Jiang Khan. Uh, the street was called Crow Robe Ali, or, or Black Robe Ali, because in the beginning, though that was where the headquarters of the Imperial Guards were, was, and the Imperial Guards wore black clothing. But later, that same quarter became the fashionable place where the highest aristocratic families of the Southern Dynasties moved in. Now, the Southern Dynasties, apart from a period of disunion, was characterized by the weakness of imperial rule and by the establishment of what we could call a, a, an important medieval Chinese aristocracy. These noblemen, these great clans, were, during the period of disunion, more powerful than the emperors themselves. And they still managed to retain a great deal of influence during the Tang dynasty. In fact, they disappeared at the end of the Tang with the collapse of this dynasty. 
So this poem is, as I say, an ubisund. The, the poetic persona of Liu Yuxi is probably visiting the ruins or the, the remainders of Jiang Kang. He sees where the famous alley of the gilded aristocracy of the south uh, had their mansions. But now that's a dilapidated poor area and it serves as a reflection on the passage of time and on the mutability and impermanence of all power and glory. Everything must come to dust. So, okay, let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet, as usual. So, for example, the first couplet gives us, well, as usual, the title already is, is giving us a location, but the first couplet will hone in into that location. It won't specifically mention the time of the poem, but it's the present. It's implicitly the present. Contrasted with the past, with the splendorous past of, of Krauro Bali. By red bird bridge, wild plants flower. Outside Crow Robe Ali, the evening sun slants. So in the first couplet we get two images, two elements of the old capital, so human made and socially constructed, juxtaposed with or, or next to uh, two elements of nature, of wild nature, of uncultivated, uncivilized nature. So Redbird Bridge was the big bridge that was the entrance to the imperial capital. Like over the river, there was this big bridge, and then you you crossed it and you entered the capital. In it's called the Red Bridge. Uh, the red, sorry, the Red Bird. The Red Bird. Uh, is generally used for the southern entrance of imperial capitals. That would also happen in, in Heian, Japan, and would also happen in Chang'an. Like uh, the, the, the red bird is the symbol of the south, and uh, therefore the main southern entrance of the capital that leads through the main highway to the imperial palace is generally called uh, Red Bird uh, Avenue, and uh, sometimes the, the door that opens it, which is a majestic one, Red Bird uh, Gate. In fact, that's Rashomon in Kurosawa's movie about uh, Heian era Japan. So we have this bridge. Maybe the bridge still exists when Liu Yushi is visiting it, or at least a shadow of the bridge. But next to it, we do not have constructions. We have wild plants. Wild plants, not civilized urban plants. This already clearly denotes that uh, the city that was once a metropolis is now a dilapidated rural place. And the second line hones in on the idea, also with an image of the city and an image of nature. Outside Crow Robe Alley, the evening sun slants. So the alley seems to still exist, even if in a somewhat changed form. Again, it connects us, like Red Bird Bridge, to the old capital, Jiang Kang. Outside it, the sun, the evening sun is slanting. So the sun is setting... Now, this is, again, an impression, a natural impression that Liu Yushi could have seen while visiting the city, but it's also metaphorical. The slanting sun, the setting sun, is like the setting sun over the splendors of this city. The, the setting sun acts as a metaphor for the decline of this city, the decline and fall of this imperial capital and its inhabitants. Second couplet. Swallows that nested by noblemen's mansions now fly into houses of the common people. So the, the second couplet, in a way, does not represent a, a radical break with the first couplet. It continues with an image of nature, in this case the swallows moving and flying about, around a human-made structure. So, uh, so the change here, if in the first couplet you have the old places associated with new types of plants. In the second couplet, you have an inversion. You have the same element from nature, the swallows that were in the past and that are now confronted with changed buildings in a changed population. So those swallows in the past that nested in Crow Robe Alley in the past and continue to nest now, when they nested in the past, their residences then were noblemen's mansions. Now, those residences are Fly, houses of the common people, they're poor people's houses. Swallows that nested by noblemen's mansions now fly into houses of the common people. So there has been a significant change. The places of the rich, this is a very popular theme in, as I said, Ubisunt. It's also very topically developed by Taoistically inclined writers. So in the Chuangzi, you have stories about 
how with the passage of time mountains turn into uh, oceans or valleys and vice versa. So there's this idea of change and instability and impermanence is the lot of everything that humans build. So the swallows now no longer nest in palaces, they nest in hovels. Interesting comment, uh, so, so the, the translator says noblemen's mansions. In the original it says the halls of the chaise and the ants. And uh, that's a reference to two of the, very, of the most important aristocratic clans from, from the period of this union. Uh, the, the Wangs were the Wang clan from Lanya, and they were very important when Jiang Khan became the imperial capital during the Eastern Jin dynasty, when the north fell to the barbarians and the imperial house managed to flee to the south. And uh, one of the builders of this translation, of this translatio in the Latin sense of this move from the north to the south, was the chancellor of the first emperor of Eastern Jin, Wan Dao, who, you know, he was a really important founding figure for the dynasty, and his descendants also occupied very high and important positions in the successive um, dynasties. And uh, the Shays are a reference to Shea An, uh, the, in this case it's the clan of the Shays from Chen. They were also very important during the Eastern Jin dynasty. Shea An was chancellor, he and his sons uh, organized uh, the, the, the victory of the Eastern Jin forces against the northern barbarians in the Battle of the Fay River Valley, which gave two more centuries, two, three centuries more of lease of life for the south of China, as opposed to the north, occupied by the barbarians. And uh, many important writers and aristocrats and noblemen came from the Shays, including one of my favorite poets, Shea Ling Yung. So a lovely piece, if you, if you like these evocations of the glorious past that has now passed away, into a nature that keeps its cycles as opposed to human society. Uh, it's a nice poem, really, a melancholy mm, philosophical poem with a touch of descriptive nature. <laughs>